these things manifest in that if you keep that those movement options open mm. and you keep somebody moving well and you keep them fit if they're a talented athlete most of the time that's that's the main thing you might be a block guy you might be a concurrent guy you maybe you're bonder chuck you could at the end of the day it's eyes on as a coach it's the guys that can really adapt and auto regulate their guys that I see being successful it took somebody telling me to do that for me to be brave enough to do it because otherwise it'd be like there's not a chance of doing that it's not going to work for me wait a minute who's arguing about this like from my perspective being completely in performance sport for two olympic cycles the argument that you don't need manual therapy is just crazy to me most people never understand or even reach their ceiling but at the end of the day it's probably because their floor wasn't high enough to show the powers that be what they were capable of. All right, Ben, we're live. Welcome to the podcast. How you doing, man? I'm good. Thanks for having me. It's How are uh, things in neon? Things are good. So as we've spoken... Weather's before, good? Uh, yeah, as we've spoken before on Instagram, you've, you've been here. Yeah, I've spent a lot of time there. Um, What's your favorite crazy. pub? <laughs> do you know what i've not actually uh been to a pub in neon yet so next time i'm there you'll you'll have to take me yeah yeah i'll i'll, I'll say it out right for those who live around here the fisherman's pub is the place to go this is uh where myself and the rugby boys used to party back then it's not what it used to be of course but it's still pretty good i'll bear that in mind i'll let you know when i'm next over fantastic ben for those who don't know who you are can you tell us a little bit about uh you and what you do so my name is Ben Simons. I'm a Team GB bobsleigh athlete, um, two-time Olympian now, currently training for my third. Um, I'm also a sports science graduate, uh, undergraduate and, and master's level um, sports therapist and budding performance coach. That's pretty much it. Brief summary. I, li I like it. We can jump. We can jump right into it. How did you? How did you start in bobsleigh? What What led you to that? Yeah, so it's quite an interesting story. And um, I was I was doing athletics actually at the time, but um, I didn't really have any real high aspirations with with athletics. I just I enjoyed it, and uh, I was studying sports science in university at the time. So you know, I was kind of killing my spare time doing uh, track and field, specializing in the short sprints at this point, so 60 and, and 100 meters. And I'd always been super interested in ice sports because um, as I've just explained, I spent a lot of time in, in Switzerland growing up, both summer and winter. During the winter, we'd head up to the mountains and I've always loved ice sports and mountain sports. And yeah, I think Britain had had quite a lot of success with skeleton and I'd always wondered about um, doing skeleton um, but it just never really transpired until UK Sport, who are the main governing um, funding organisation for Olympic sport in the UK, they, they do a lot of talent ID and they basically travel around different sporting hubs, university campuses and run a load of tests and kind of funnel you into different sports, skeleton, bobsleigh, um, cycling, rowing, that sort of thing. And um, I knew that that was going on and people were getting funneled off into, a few people were getting funneled into skeleton and um, I'm walking into my training center at university and there's a poster on the wall that says, could you push your country at an Olympic games? And there's four guys jumping into a, a bobsleigh and then it, it shows the tests. It's a 30 meter sprint, a standing long jump, squat, bench press. And I thought, brilliant, some of my favorite things to do. And I really turned up just because I like the look of the tests because actually looking at the stature of bobsleigh athletes tend to be pretty big guys. Um, me with my kind of 60 meter sprinting frame was a lot smaller than what you'd expect for mm -hmm. the sport. So I wasn't really expecting much, but I thought it would be fun to do the trials because I could probably score well on their, on their tests. And um, I did score very well and they, they had faith in, I suppose my physical ability and um, they were hoping my ability to put on more body mass within a short space of time. How much did and you put on? Um, I put on 10k in, in a year. Nice. Yeah, yeah, that was that was all lean muscle mass too. 
but I feel like I was probably kind of artificially light because I'd been keeping myself quite light for track and field. Right. I think that's, that's a, it's another interesting conversation. Actually, I think a lot of people do that in track and field and sometimes it's not necessarily needed because there's a few examples in my sport of people allowing themselves to kind of hit a natural weight and using, doing a lot more strength work and still getting faster. So that's certainly what happened for me. Mm. I was underweight really. And I, I put that weight, weight on and I really came into my own. All of my metrics increased drastically. Mm. And, um, yeah, it culminated basically in once you get through the initial physical testing, you go down to the University of Bath, which has a, a dry land push track, which um, some of the Swiss listeners would probably be more uh, familiar with because there's a few dotted around the mountains over there. But essentially, it's something that you can push a bobsleigh on in the summer. So it's like a bobsleigh on wheels, essentially. How, how long and is the straight on, on the ice? How long is it? The straight, yeah. Until you have yeah, yeah. So, so, so the start is. Um, it's, you'll, you'll usually jump, be jumping in within about 50 meters, although the different positions on the sled get in at slightly different times. But the start timing is a split time from 15 to 65 meters. So that's where, it, where it's timed. But you'll usually be in by, on average, probably 40, 45 meters. Yeah. And how, how heavy yeah. is the, the bobsleigh? Uh, four, a four-man sled is 210 kilos, and a two-man is 170, 170 kilos. Fantastic. Um, yeah. So that basically, all that talent ID process culminated in a single-man push, which is where you push a trolley, which is at a certain weight on a push track. And it's like, right, if you don't hit this time, that's it. You're done. So everyone came in. If they hit it, they got through. If they didn't, they were gone. And... Um, yeah, I, I certainly found something that I was just naturally pretty well suited to and pushed very well on day one. And I haven't looked back since. That was, I realized I'd found the sport for me. Mm. How, how much do you, do you think that is a, is a factor, just kind of suiting your own individual attributes to the actual sport that you have in mind versus just going into the sport that you like the most? Yeah, I think there's... I think a lot of that goes on. A lot of that happens. I mean, on the flip side, you could look at it in the um, most talented athletes could turn their hand to a lot of different sports. Mm -hmm. And I think you see it probably more so. I think it's coming out in research, certainly in the US, that the multi-sport athletes uh, at youth level um, tend to progress more in professional leagues. Um, so, but I think there's a lot of early specialization that goes on is it's probably especially in the UK, really, with like football and rugby being the main sports, uh, mm. cricket, track and field, probably just below that. Um, yeah, people specialize super early because high school sport isn't such a big thing either, you know. Mm. So it's just like you, you've got kids specializing before they've even finished their development. And I just think that kind of um, you might not progress your ceiling to where it could be without those movement options. And yeah, but for me personally, I think the there was always going to be a limiting factor with with track and field because the the main attribute to determine success in the events that I was I was doing, um, which ended up being long jump and short sprints, the, the biggest factor in those is top speed, and my acceleration, my explosive power, all of that stuff was very very good, um, world class level really. Uh, top speed was nowhere near that. There are those, there were certainly quite a few coaches that argued it was just um, a lot of glaring technical issues that could be sorted out. Um, but I certainly didn't have time to be basically gambling that when I found a sport that was uh, longer ground contact time and more acceleration based than mm -hmm. I was suited to. Mm -hmm. And it was the best decision I could have made. But I think a lot of people get, you do get people funneling in from who may not have that absolute world-class reactivity to have ridiculous top speed may not have the good coordination or even just contacts within the sport to make it in a team sport like football or rugby and um so you get this kind of bunch of freaks from all sorts of different backgrounds that can just push a sled really quick um because it's a pretty 
simple initially it's a pretty simple thing to do before you actually have to put it into a team environment and then the synergy comes into it but it is essentially just pushing a sled from a to b it's a resisted sprint mm. and um when you change that contact time slightly and you add load and resistance to people it's quite surprising how that changes who's successful and who isn't and it's not necessarily right if this guy is the quickest over 30 meters um you add even just the one shining at different levels of resistance and different loads mm. which is pretty interesting i remember and then I Sorry to cut you off. I remember, I think it was Kier Wenham Flat talking about Sonny Bill Williams and how his top speed isn't amazing, but you could put 40, 50 kgs behind him and he'll run the same speed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that you get, you get a lot of people like that that are really successful in my sport. They may, may not have the gear five and six of a real sprinter, um, but those first three gears and you, you add a load on them that incredible and um, it's interesting actually talking about sonny bill our our sprint coach for the bobsay team a guy called mike Kamel, who influenced a lot of my um kind of coaching methods he was originally down in australia after he left russia and uh he he worked with him briefly when he was working with rugby over there mm -hmm. and um we used to have this harness that he'd put around our waist and this harness, I don't know where it come from. It looked like something between a, a weightlifting harness and then it had a, a proper, like, two plastic handles. You know, everyone else had a, just a lifting band around the waist doing mm -hmm. partner resistance. Mike had this, this device and it had a proper clip on it. It was lovely. I, was, I said, where did you get that? And he's like, oh, it's when I was coaching down in the U.S. Um, I had the guys in, in this and I just I, I took them with me one day. One of those guys was Sonny Bill Williams, and I was like, no way. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> um, so yeah, he was. Uh, he saw. A, he saw a lot through his. And still sees a lot now. He's coaching. In fact, he's. I think he's a Swiss national coach for, for sprints now. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, yeah. After he left us, um, but yeah, that's just a funny little anecdote as as the name was put in there. No, no, that's that's good. I want to go back to bobsled training, obviously, and uh, what your what your training week looks like, and and more. But I want to go back to the maybe long term athlete development that that we quickly touched on before. I know you're big on, on the general prep, on, on building a base. And mm. I guess you could transfer that to the more macro aspect of an athlete, the, the wider the base in, in all skills and all development mm. parts in different sports when they're young allows them to have a, maybe a pinnacle that's, that's higher down the, down the line. Yeah, yeah. I think it's interesting. I'm not sure I like the term building the base. And I, I just I think it might just set a precedent that is slightly off what the aim of a general preparation phase is. And I actually keep a lot of those general elements in the program throughout. So the way I do the vast majority of my programming is, uh, I suppose you could call it concurrent in nature or even vertical integration if you use a Charlie Francis um, type of setup. So I keep those right up until quite a late stage within the training phase. I keep the general means in there. And I think they achieve a lot of different things. And what I've found from my own personal experience is I'm, I'm influenced a lot by, um, obviously, by track and field because that was a sport that I came from. And I think a lot of the coaching literature and stuff that I was able to find online was great track and field coaches and um, i started off i think i probably learned more on the charlie francis forums than i did actually at, at university and i spent most of my spare time on those those forums um much to the annoyance of my lecturers and yeah i, I just i learned a lot through just speaking to those people with with experience and then meeting the coaches that i was lucky enough to be to be trained by mm -hmm. um I was picked up by a jumps coach when I was only 16 who was, was near me in the UK who had coached, I think he'd co he coached at five different Olympics in, in high jump. So yeah, I definitely just learned a lot more from their methodology and I did really what I was learning, certainly in, in my education. Mm -hmm. But a lot of their kind of setups were 
had a lot of general movement in there, a lot of general exercise and looking at just getting fit essentially. And I think the scientific head I had on at the time, especially with what I was learning, just sifting through studies and stuff. Um, I kind of thought this doesn't make sense. It's not specific. Um, we're not going for the right adaptations. Um, there's going to be cross signaling going on. I'm not going to be getting the most out of my training. Um, as the kind of arrogant young brain thinks, and as I've come further along, certainly in my in my training career, and now that I've started coaching, I'm seeing these things manifest. In that, if you keep that those movement options open, mm. and you keep somebody moving well, and you keep them fit, if they're a talented athlete, most of the time that's that's the main thing. And I think people getting really really specific. Um, that often just leads to, and certainly for me, has led to a lot of issues. And I think looking for, and I think the, the gym is a really good example because there's a lot of, re, so much research is done on s and 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 the adaptations that you can get in the weight room and from the weight room. But my experience with really pushing, certainly heavy compound bilateral lifts and Olympic lifts is, yeah, you're going to get a lot of adaptation for it, but there's there's a blowback as well in that I'm going to just set off compensatory movement patterns like crazy. I'm going to hobble out of there because something's not right. Mm-hmm. And actually, all the general work then around that for me, I found it's been almost like an antidote. It can really counteract some of the, um, not necessarily damage, damage is the wrong word, but jump some of the overload that you're getting from, from other aspects. And I think especially the overload you're getting in the gym. So I keep those general aspects in right throughout the training, the annual plan um, as kind of an antidote to some of those issues that are arising. Yeah, and it, it gives you, I guess, well-rounded is the word that comes to mind. Just, you know, being able to do everything. And like you said, almost at all times uh, makes it that you, you don't miss anything. Because like you said, if you're too specific, you're obviously going to miss a bunch of general stuff or... Uh, you know, the more the more I, I look at things, you know, from a slightly farther away standpoint, um, you just look at the overall program and then see what's there and what's missing. Mm. And usually, if you could spot if there's something, if there's a if there's some basic thing that's oh they're not doing any endurance type stuff, or they're not doing any high inter- high intensity type stuff, or they're not mm. doing you know something in the middle, or they're not doing any jumping, any sprinting, mm. any heavy, any unilateral. You can find a hole, and it, usually, if you plug that hole, it, it might not, you know, boost their performance like crazy. But at least you're gonna you're gonna give them something good, and, and they're gonna be able able to build from that. Sure, sure. I think I'm always looking at balance when when I look at the program, and trying to take quite a wide lens on it all. And I'm thinking about them as a human first, really, just making sure, like you say, all of those those holes are plugged. It, it does make things difficult in that you have a lot of different, there's a lot of different stimuli in there. And so it's quite hard to predict adaptation and know exactly what is working. But I think for most, most people, most coaches and most people that are programming, if you can find the kind of template blueprint that will work for a certain type of person, it's quite easy to roll that out and then adjust it for whatever their individual needs are. And so, you know, I'm talking about that as a very green coach and I'm sure I'm going to look back on what I do in 10 years time now and think that was stupid or that was crazy. But what I will say at the moment is I get pretty good results out of my athletes and my athletes appreciate how I program and they they enjoy it too, which is a, a huge part of it. I'm still learning from my own personal perspective as well. So a lot of what I do now is based on my own experience after training, probably attempting to train optimally since I was probably 18 years old. So, you know, I'm 33 now. So it's it's a long time. It's a lot of experimentation, Mm -hmm. but I suppose I've been quite lucky in that I've reacted to pretty much every very differing type of training that's been thrown at me. And that that's lucky for me in that I could always uh, find a way and compete. But part of me wishes that I'd found at least the perfect formula 
for myself. But that just leads me back to the question, <laughs> the, um, the old adage that there's more than one way to skin a cat, right? Um, mm-hmm. I think any, just sticking stringently to any approach or any methodology uh, doesn't really make any sense because humans are just so complicated. And it's the same when you come down to, and this was, I think, the big thing I got from working with great coaches. When it's one-on-one coaching, the auto-regulation ability and how fluidly they can change reps, uh, uh, distances, volume, just from maybe anything but from body language, they will, they will just manipulate these things. And like that's the holy grail for, for me. So, you know, people go mad on periodization. You know, you might be... You might be a block guy. You might be a concurrent guy. You maybe your bonder chuck. You could. At the end of the day, it's eyes on as a coach. It's the guys that can really adapt and auto regulate their guys that see being successful. So when I'm working one on one, that's what I really like to try and do. Um, that's certainly a lot more difficult online. Mm-hmm. A lot more difficult. And so my my programming online is is quite complicated in that quite complicated, quite in depth is the right term, I think, because I don't have, I can't be there to manipulate. So you need to give, you need to give the variables and if this, then that. And so that they can do the own adjusting of their own accord based on what they feel or do or, or don't do that day. Yeah. Yeah. When they're going into kind of peaking phases, the, the, or high performance phases, I'll have a lot of ABC options depending on, um, the wellness scores, et cetera. Um, it's a lot more difficult online and that's why, you know, I really do love one-to-one coaching. Um, and so, and that's where the experience is, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the more that, the more that you do, the, the, the better you're going to be at that job. And, uh, that's, I, I suppose I was, I was impressionable, um, right throughout my kind of training career and a lot of what those early track and field coaches did and and the coaches that I met through bobsleigh really rubbed off on me so I think that was I was kind of already learning and that was already shaping my uh, coaching style or even programming style from Mm -hmm. from day one really if we go back to to your own training uh in in bobs in and for bobsleigh what did your training week look like when you when you started in this sport and Mm. What does your training look like now? Yeah, so that's um, <laughs> that's that's a good journey. That's a good journey there. So, like I said early on, when I was still doing track and field, I was really, I was really into Charlie Francis stuff, and so I was going high low. Um, so Monday, Wednesday, Friday were high. Um, yeah, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday were low. Running every day, so it was high intensity sprints on those high days, and I was doing tempos on the low days probably why i was only 78 kilos at the time um and yeah i was i was so tied to that idea i was so tied to that idea and i was so tied to the whole cns fatigue argument Mm. when i went to bobsleigh and the coaches started programming me completely differently i just couldn't quite get my head around uh, how this is going to work so I had, I, I was really tied to high, low and CNS fatigue. And the fact that if you're, if you're fatigued or feeling any adaptation soreness, you can't achieve high outputs of speed. So you shouldn't run fast that day. I was tied to those two really, uh, really quite fundamental ideas of Charlie's approach. Mm-hmm. When I actually came over and started training full time for Bob so I moved down to the training center. Um, this was the summer before the uh, Sochi 2014 Olympics. And the, the coach there at the time, SNC and push coach, Chris Woolley, um, very good coach. His programming was completely different. Um, it, was, it was high intensity every day. So there'd be one high intensity element every day of the week that was different. The, the lifting was, you could probably call it conjugate. So there was, there was a lot of variation there. Mm-hmm. so i was getting a lot of adaptation soreness and i was getting a huge amount of doms and i was just tired all the time and then you'd turn up with the rest of the guys and you'd push through it 
So I'm turning up with horrific doms thinking, I've got a flying 30 session today. And I was surprised that I was hitting okay times. Not quite, you know, not 195 to, well, not, not 100, anywhere near 100%, but they were, they were pretty good times, they're acceptable. Um, but in my mind, I was thinking there's no chance that this goes against all the principles that I think are um, set in stone. And it was the opposite. I, I adapted, you know, it pushed me into a hole. Um, yeah, we got super compensation and I shaved three tenths off my, my 60 meter time through gates. Mm. Um, yeah, I took, how much did I take off my flying 30? I took about two tenths off my flying 30. This is eight to 10 kilos heavier as well in, in like 12 months. And so that was just kind of like, right, mind blown. Um, the high low argument doesn't necessarily work anymore. And then when you go on to the bobsleigh season, your training has to change completely because. How often for, do you race? Um, you race every week from um, probably November to February. Once, so is it, is it like once a, a week? Is there, is there like multiple? Once a week, yeah. Once a week. Okay. Yeah, pretty much once a week. There'll be some breaks. There'll be a Christmas break. There'll be a little break before the World Championships, which will be usually late February, early March. So you've got to, you've got to compete every week throughout that whole period. And you've got to train on the ice um, at least four to five days a week as well. So every day you're, you're pushing a sled, not necessarily at full tilt, but you're pushing a sled, you're warming up and pushing a sled every day. Mm. And so again, I turn up on Bob's ATs and I'm thinking this is not an ideal way to be training. So right, every day, warm up on a car park, accelerate, um, push a sled for two runs. So basically two 30 meter resistance sprints. And then in the afternoon, you either lift or you find a hill or a track if you're lucky do some sprints um so just some frequency 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 turn training twice a day six days a week with a competition every week and i'm thinking this is just not an ideal way to train lo and behold come to the christmas testing um that year and again performance has has risen significantly against all my expectations and everything that i held to be true all of my periodization ideas thrown out of the window. How much, so sorry to cut you off. How much did you have to shift in that period? How much did you have to shift all the lifestyle means, the sleep, the nutrition, I guess the nutrition you had to change for the weight gain, or if I'm not mistaken, like you said before, but did, did all the other elements that influence, I guess the potential to perform and to adapt and to develop, did those kind of, rise up to your attention even more than they maybe did before when you were sticking to that high low model where maybe the need to recover wasn't as high it was it was an, it's an interesting environment to be in because you're you don't really have any control over the fatigue you're going to be feeling you might be in the garage until midnight the night before a race fixing the sled um the hotel food might not be very good especially in the u.s i mean some of the times in the u.s we just live off junk food i was it was it was crazy it made no sense it made no sense i thought this cannot work but somehow it worked we still performed well um injury rates didn't fly up through the roof but you could argue you were a bit more contained in what you were doing um, we were pushing a sled what i find is that a lot of the certainly soft tissue injuries that you get with top speed sprinting is somewhat mitigated when you're offloaded on a sled. So you could argue that, yeah, maybe you're more contained than if you were sprinting outright every day, but at the same time you're warming up in minus 10 on a car park, you'd expect things to pop up. And then when you when your recovery is, is stunted as well, because of factors out of your control, whether you're fixing the sled, whether your hotel food isn't very good, you'd expect there to be issues, but there weren't any more issues than I would have usually got on the flip side we had some pretty good physios and uh, therapists with us that were able to keep us in shape and i think you leave a lot of lifestyle factors at home daily stresses that people usually don't think of as being significant 
just aren't part of your life when you're on tour mm. because you're in a hotel. So you're not cooking, you're not washing your dishes, you're not doing your own laundry. So a lot of those other stresses are thrown out. So I think it kind of evened up a little bit, to be quite honest. Mm. That makes sense. And, and so how did that develop to today into your, your own training now? You're preparing for mm. your, your third uh, games. What, what does that look like now? So after Sochi, I got, um, I was really quite hurt after Sochi 2014. So I had um, pretty bad osteitis pubis and that took a lot of rehabilitation. I was very lucky to be supported by the British Olympic Association there. And there's a rehabilitation center with all of your doctors, physios, S&Cs under one roof. And you can stay there and get sorted out. And I did that through the summer of, of 2014. Mm -hmm. And again, came away from any high intensity stimulus at all. Didn't run at all. And again, came out of that rehabilitation process with a couple of weeks of running and uh, a 30 meter and standing long jump PB again, made absolutely no sense. And then I took that's that pushed me back towards a lot of the general work that I'd done. Certainly when I was working on the high, low scheme on the low days, mm. I basically took a lot of the rehabilitation work, which was pretty um, low level core stability work and i used that on the lower days but i didn't completely go back to a high low scheme what i'd also discovered was that i was as a lot of athletes are as much better after a day of activity than i was after a day of rest mm -hmm. so the week always started with a potentiation day so the first two days were were impact days monday was potentiation um, so on that Monday, I'd keep pushes and sprints a little bit shorter. I'd keep the gym um, very much concentric and uh, neural drive based. And then that would essentially prep me for Tuesday, which would be my impact day. And that's where I'd just be going for the max outputs and then on the track and then in the gym, maximum strength. Wednesday would, the, would then be regeneration day. Um, so at the moment, this is looking like what I've seen as a uh, Stu McMillan microcycle, the first three days, potentiation, uh, impact day and a regen day. But then on the Thursday, Friday, Saturday, um, I kind of went back to what I've been introduced to with the bobsleigh training, which was just um, lift, sprint, lift. Uh, so it was a big high intensity lift or a big high intensity sprint without much thought around CNS recovery within that um around this time as well uh, one of my ex-teammates started working for dna fit with one of the early companies to adopt dna testing mm -hmm. and yeah it, it seemed like compared to my teammates always had the that also had the same tests that my recovery rate would be significantly higher uh, because of my genetic makeup so that made sense as to why i was probably reacting well to uh, frequency over the old high low model i probably mm -hmm. didn't need that 48 hours between high intensity components and that worked very very well leading up to the pyeongchang 2018 olympics so i got my best performances of my career out there and i broke a couple of squad records and that was definitely the uh, the best physical shape that that i've been in then since then it's been really all over the place because we lost our uk sport funding after pyeongchang mm -hmm. so I just started my own, my, my business as well. Cause I expected to retire after Pyeongchang too. Um, so I'd been setting up my business and ready to go into the world of, of coaching and, and performance. And I just couldn't shake the itch to, to compete. <laughs> so again, I went away the next winter on the premise that I want to try and get a good result. So the lads that are coming through after me can get, have the same, get everything from the sport that I got. And you know what, that, that result was, was achieved. We got a really good result, but UK sport weren't prepared to fund this. And then, so at that point I was like, yeah, definitely retiring. Um, really just going to push my program in and my business as much as I can. So then that next summer I just really pushed the business and just kind of 
trained when I could. So I was also training. I did my sports massage training, um, sports acupuncture training. I really didn't have much time. If I had an, an hour every other day to train, I'd, I'd take that. And a lot of the time it was just me filming content for, for Instagram and exercises for clients. Mm. And yeah, I'd lost loads of weight. I was about back down to about 86 kilos. I'm jumping out of the room and broke a load of jump PBs because pretty much lost all my upper body mass. And um, so again, the bug was still there. One of the pilots phoned me, you know, can you can compete again this season? Thought, I'll have a go, turn up to the testing that year. Again, got into the team. And then at that point, you're two years out from another winter game. So I'm like, right, I, yeah, I can think I can carry on here. <laughs> and yeah, so then it's only really been now that I'm a year in, yeah, a year out from the, the Beijing games that I'm starting to train nearer to, near enough full time again. So it's a lot more difficult now. I'm not funded. I'm having to fund my own life at the moment. And so it means that there's not as much time to train. But the last three years has just been really haphazard in the way I've trained. So what I've done now this year is, um, you know, I've bought, I've bought on a guy who I've worked with briefly in the past. He's a physio that came out to, to work with us um, in 2018. Um, a guy called Dara Curran. He's a, he's a physiotherapist by, um, by profession, um, but it's very, very clued up. Um, he spent some time in the States and um, some time at Altis and some time at the, in the American college system. Mm -hmm. And I just realized that despite having quite a lot of experience and knowledge now myself, I've never been 33 before. And I've, you know, never coached a 33 year old athlete one-on-one. -on -one trying to go for their third olympics so i brought him on board to kind of overlook how i was programming and what i was doing with my training as well as do the uh, obviously the physio stuff that get me on the bed and um sort out all of my joints and all of the aches and pains that have put me on my back over the last few years and yeah this is taking me even more back to the the general general approach basically mm -hmm. and i'd got so specific over the last few years because i only had probably an hour to train every other day so what are you going to do if you only got an hour to train every other day you do all the specific high intensity stuff so i'd, I'd either sprint fast or i'd power clean it's pretty much as simple as that or a box jump or a dunk just simple as that no no self-management, no soft tissue, no physio, um, no general prep, no circuits, no stretching, none of that stuff all went out. So it's like, right, we've just got to strip this right back down and do general prep phase. Loads of movement that you haven't done in years. Perfusion, just loads of blood flow. And yeah, I've, I've felt really good off it. Um, body weight's in a good place too, because it's just loads of... Uh, rep work essentially mm. and yeah as soon as i came back into something resembling resembling specific work the metrics that i was looking at so at the moment i'm just looking at you know overhead shot throws and standing long jumps quite basic stuff and they're looking good so again not been specific now for probably 10 weeks but i'm, I'm still able to get some really good outputs and when i talk about not being specific i literally haven't haven't sprinted mm. It's been, it's been tempo or um, just multi-directional kind of agility work. Yeah, so it's just pretty interesting. But it, it took me, it took somebody telling me to do that for me to be brave enough to do it because otherwise it'd be like, there's not a chance of doing that. It's not going to work for me. How important has been the, the physio work and all the soft tissue work over the years as a, as a high-level athlete? Uh, because I think yeah. we, we always see the training, but we never really see that side of things. But again, if you you know, you read Charlie Francis and you see that the, whether it's, it was a physio or massage therapist was instrumental in preparing his athletes and helping them recover. You look at the, you look at the Chinese weightlifters, they, they walk on each other. You look at the Russians, they have a massage hall attached to their weightlifting training hall. So can you talk about this aspect a little bit? I think it's 
it probably needs a little bit more visibility because it, it is such an important part of, of uh, trading. Yeah. Level. Yeah. I mean, it was absolutely huge for me and all of my fellow athletes. And it's actually surprised me recently. I only just kind of realized after putting up a question on somebody asked me a question on my story a few weeks ago about how important is manual therapy. My, my answer was name your world records that hasn't used all of those techniques that's been achieved without manual therapy. And um, I got a load of responses there saying, oh, that's it's a good answer. I, I need to, you know, I need that answer next time I'm having an argument about it. And I thought, wait a minute, who's arguing about this? Like from my perspective, being completely in performance sport for two Olympic cycles, the argument that you don't need manual therapy is just crazy to me. It's crazy to me. And when you're working with elite athletes, when literally tiny percentages are so important, it's, it's huge. We had, we had a really talented, and we still have a really talented physiotherapist. Um, he's, he's great hands-on. Um, and he, he could literally get, he could, if I saw him before performing, I would be quicker. It's as simple as that. If, because also my, with my issues around the osteitis pubis and the, the SI joint, etc., I would, my SI joint would be out quite often. So I'd, I'd have to be adjusted back into place pr pretty often. And yeah, you'll get the people arguing, well, you know, corrective exercise, X, Y, and Z. Well, didn't really have time for that. You know, I'm already training optimally two sessions a day um, to push for five seconds. So I need, whereas Raf, the physio, he could adjust me in two seconds and then literally let me fly. Now that's not poo-pooing. Um, corrective exercise that has to be built in but if it's testing day or race day and i'm out i need adjusting it's as simple as that so for me and all of the athletes i um, worked with it was it was huge and then when i when i was in rehabilitation for the osteitis pubis like the the biggest part of that was um was physio and hands-on adjustments mm. um certainly to my lower back and, and sij it's huge and when you when you experience the changes that a good physical therapist can can make, when you experience that, it's just an, you have no doubt. And then now that I'm on the other side, that I got my soft tissue qualification and my acupuncture qualification, and I'm treating people, and so you see the same changes being made by yourself. On to somebody else, there's no doubt. There, there is there is no doubt and the, the the issue is that nobody it, it doesn't really matter what the naysayers are saying because anybody that wants to perform well is going to use these techniques anyway because they can't afford to be an experiment they can't afford to not be a hundred percent so they're going to need those guys around you get the odd you get the odd athlete that says oh yeah i don't get much body work i, I don't need it well do you know what they're lucky them you know they're, they're lucky well done you're robust some people aren't i'd love to be that robust never was if i hadn't had if i hadn't had any manual therapy um my career I, yeah i wouldn't have made it out of my early 20s in in uh, high level sport not a chance not a chance i was i was ready to after after sochi 2014 when i got osteitis pubis i was ready to to can it right there and that'll end a lot of careers in, in rugby and Aussie rules, for example. It ends a lot of careers, that, that, that injury. But you know what? I rehabbed that without surgery. I had three residential stays um, in a rehabilitation unit with manual therapy, S&C, every day. So that was a therapy and corrective exercise. And yeah, I've, I've had a, a, another Olympic cycle since then. Yeah, that's, that's that's a career and an injury. That's it's pretty phenomenal the the impact that this has had. I'll, I'll have two more questions about the bobsled, then I want to move on to talk more about your your coaching and programming. I'm I'm interested from your perspective, um, but I guess that the numbers speak for themselves. What's what's the influence of the start in bobsled on the on the final result? Yeah, it's it's huge. Um, basically, you don't often finish 
any more than three places away from where you started. So you get a start rank and a, and a finish rank essentially on time. Mm -hmm. Only the finish rank counts for the final result. But it's, it's very unusual. Like There's got to be a huge mistake if a team is three places outside their start time. So if you ever look at a timesheet for bobsleigh, you have the finish times like one, two, three, four, and then you'll have the start times there. So there's always a little bit of a battle with the, the brakemen and push athletes to uh, have the best start time. But then your finishing time there is obviously where you get your medals. But th they always match up pretty, pretty closely. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's huge. You basically, you can't add any more velocity to the sled once you're in it. Right. You, you cannot add any more velocity. And can then only, can that, only use it down the, down the ice. Yeah, yeah, essentially. And then that, um, basically, you go from, you start at zero. Your average speed down most of the track is, is very high. So what you can do within the, that's the only place that you really accelerate. So the, the, the sled will gradually accelerate till the fastest point of the track. But the acceleration from zero to, you know, 30 kilometers an hour is huge, like right at the start of the race. That's where you can make the biggest difference. Um, so, yeah, I think that the general public don't really realize how important the start is. It's, um, it's yeah, it's huge. Basically, you'll never finish far away from where you, where you start. Um, and, yeah, that's, that's part and parcel, more so than probably the other ice sports. So I'd say it's more integral than... Uh, skeleton or luge and then the the flip side of that uh, besides i guess the the driver as a as a key role down the ice but for the other uh crew crew members what is there a technical component during the during the race so it's interesting my like arrow so obviously the driver's got to steer steer the sled down the track so so he has the, the big job there your job it sounds pretty simple it's just to get in and get down. But that's easier said than done. Obviously, you're kind of almost tied together with the other three guys in the crew because you're sitting essentially in each other's laps. And then you've got to hit a really aerodynamic position. And that's pretty uncomfortable because you've got to really pull yourself down. So you've already got a massively curved spine. You're pulling yourself down even further and you've got you slap in six G's on top of you in, in some of the corners. And then within that, you've got to stay stable as well. So if your heads go out of line, like one, two, three, four, heads all out of line, right? The, the aerodynamics is affected. So you've all got to stay stable. You've got to drill your helmet into the back of the guy in front of you. Um, you know, my, my back has been someone's helmet's been in there so hard i've been bleeding after the the race and then you've got people's eye spikes cutting you and stuff like it's super uncomfortable and but yeah essentially you just kind of get in and get into an aerodynamic position and hold that all the way to the bottom mm -hmm. um but mishaps do happen and you've got to keep your your wits about you people might slip getting in you've got to try and pull them into the sled people might be sitting wrong and if you're sitting on someone's ankle in the wrong position and you're going to get hit with six G's, you could break their ankle. So you've got to have enough about you that you can actually get their ankle out and put it in the right position. There's a lot of instances in the past of people just going into with all that adrenaline, you go into self preservation mode. People end up getting hurt because they're just thinking about themselves. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a massive team effort, but as a brakeman, yeah, your work is really done at the start. Um, but you can mess it up by not riding right down the track. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That makes sense. I want to, like I said before, talk about you and what you do in regards to coaching and programming now. Um, and you, you did mention before that, you know, you're, you're still a young coach, but uh, maybe in the, in the last few years when you, when you started, what have been some of the early mistakes you've made uh, when you transitioned to coaching from, you know, mm -hmm. being a full-time athlete? <laughs> That's a good question. I think um, I think it's always easy early on to think that your your blueprint that you worked out for yourself is going to work for the majority of people that you're working with. And I kind of knew that wasn't going, wasn't going to be the case, but I I still look back at some of those programs and think that that's still coming from your your perspective and your lens, and that's still looks quite similar to how you were 
programming yourself at that time. So even though I was aware of it, it was still manifesting in the programs that I was, I was writing. And there wasn't any major issues there. I think, yeah, perhaps for a couple of guys, the volume was, was a little bit high. And I look back and, um, you know, if somebody's, if somebody then um, started to get a sore Achilles or sore plantar fascia or, you know, I'm like, right, yeah, maybe your volume is too high. But then on the flip side, some people had the same volume and obviously did, did really well because that's what happens. Everybody's different, right? Um, so I think just the, the consultation process got a little bit broader and then I'd always finish that, try and finish that up with, with a conversation at least because I was, I just found that I was, I'd get more feeling for the individual if I could actually have a conversation with them because mm-hmm. it is tough when you're not one-on-one with somebody. So the vast majority of what I was doing was, was online because before I even started the business, I was getting requests for, for, for programming. And yeah, I think that was probably the biggest issue was just um, kind of look, yeah, looking from my, my own lens too much, like what volumes had worked for me in the past, um, what setups, what, how I'd set up the weekly microcycle, all those different things. Whereas then after a, a couple of years of programming, you suddenly, you know, I look at what I've done now and my, my programs are so different for each individual you know, depending on their level, depending on their lifestyle. So that's a massive thing is, is, is lifestyle. So I just, I ask a lot more lifestyle questions now when I do consultations. Mm-hmm. So it was all very, as you can imagine, all very performance-based at first. Consultations, pretty performance-based on what metrics, age, um, what's worked for you in the past, what programs you've done, any examples of old programs. But just asking about people's lifestyle, their, their nine to five, their availability for training, their um, stress levels, all of that sort of stuff. That, that, that was huge. That was huge. And so, yeah, I think, yeah, probably that consultation process is what changed the most. I want to go, we talked about it a little bit so far, but I wanted to go back to it in, in a bit more detail, talking about that general to specific continuum. Mm-hmm. How do you, how do you apply this now with the different people that you're coaching? Um, mm-hmm. is there a ratio that you look to hit at certain periods of, of, of the year, depending on when competition time is, um, how much of that general work do you keep in close to competition or even in competition season? If we're talking, for example, let's talk about a rugby athlete, mm. a rugby player where you have an off season where you could pretty much do whatever you want, but then in season, it's quite a different ball game between training and, and playing. So how do you, how do you play with those, uh, with those different parts of training? Yeah, that depends a lot on the, the individual circumstances of each, each athlete. So, um access to therapy is a huge one Mm. um if they've got good access to to physio or or any type of physical therapy really um some of the some of the general volume can drop out that's been my experience because the the effect that i've seen with a lot of the general work is um like i've said to kind of counteract some of the the stress from other areas in the program to give you the movement options there that um kind of just pull you keeping equilibrium within everything and usually a therapist will do that very well Mm. so it depends a lot of the time it depends on how much therapy they've got access to and really especially with um with games players so with with rugby guys i do stick stick to the kind of vertical integration model and they will all the elements will still remain in their playing season but just as much lower doses and so it will be more of a kind of micro dose what i'm looking for is like almost a hormetic effect of the different strain training stimuli during that season period um especially speed work because you know a lot of the time they might not get a chance to hit that um really high velocity in game or training situations and then if they are thrown into that in the chaos of the game um that's what i've seen when when things go wrong right hamstring injuries etc so as long as i'm keeping a certain frequency of near top end sprinting in and this is just an example of uh, specifically looking at how i'd program the speed work within season Mm -hmm. um then you know that 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 base is covered 
but then all of the other components are in at a low low volume as well. Um, I'll still use I'll still use isometrics during the playing season. So like long hold isometrics, not super intense. Um, what I've found is they just seem to really mitigate um, a lot of tendon issues, a lot of tendon pain. And at the same time, just keep some um, quite sp specific joint angles and position strong. So I'll use um, like a sprint position isometric between two boxes. Mm -hmm. um, so like almost like a, a long lever hip thrust between two boxes, but one knee up, other leg straight. So you're really hitting high hamstring glute. Um, so just prolong that holes in those positions. Uh, um, so Alex Natera comes to mind when you say that. Yeah, 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 sure. So yeah, um, definitely not at those intensities. Yeah, right. definitely not at those intensities. So no, ju I, just I just like, thought of the position and and that came. Yeah, to yeah, def definitely similar to to what he'd use on his uh, ISO catch or ISO push um, between boxes, mm -hmm. um, but at longer holds essentially, and. Um, actually going away from what you'd see in um in research for, for tendon uh, rehabilitation so away from the 30 or 45 seconds kind of looking at the minute mark mm -hmm. um and i've just found that to work really well and that would be a separate session so i usually put that in in the evening on high intensity days mm -hmm. and i just find that calms things down a little bit um within the system um so that's just that's been an interesting that's not based on a lot other than my observations really um, but that's an example of something very, very general that I'll be keeping in uh, during the playing season. And then, yeah, some, yeah, I'm not really going to be pushing for adaptation in that, that, that period either. You know, that's all going to be in the off season. So the volume will change drastically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Talk about, uh, I've heard you talk about this before and I, I like, I like the idea. It's something that I, that I read about in the, the talent code, if I'm not mistaken, performance floors and ceilings and yeah. differences between individuals could you expand on that yeah it's um well i see it time and time again i don't think anyone really knows their ceiling and you, you won't know it in, in, unless you push yourself to it i think that's one of the real tragedies about early dropout from sport and i think that's one of the real issues about um putting all of your resources into young talents when there are people that could possibly surpass them. Um, one of my teammates is a great example, actually. I've got a teammate who, who ran sub 10, he ran 996 a couple of years ago. Unfortunately, probably a week too late to qualify for the Rio Olympics. He ran it in, in 2016. And um, no one was expecting that. I used to compete against him when I was a, a teenager because we're from the same area in the UK. And um, we were always good starters, both me and him. And then we'd all, all always kind of just get tied up in the last 40 of a race, you know? And he'd run significantly quicker than me by the time he started bobsleigh. I think he'd run 10.49. Um, but obviously not set in the world of like a 23 year old running 10.49 in the UK is, you know, that's no one's gonna invest any time or money into that athlete, certainly at an elite level. And then, yeah, five years of doing bobsleigh and um, he's run 996. Not bobsleigh training, you know? <laughs> and he'd have, never, he'd have never had any investment. Any UK sport wouldn't have thrown money at him. British athletics wouldn't have supported him. He wouldn't have had healthcare support, right? Because he wasn't a talented junior. But when he ran that time, he was the third fastest Briton of all time. No one knew what his ceiling was. And he wouldn't have had the opportunity to find that ceiling if it wasn't for him finding a sport that he was elite at at 23, which was bobsleigh. And it was a secondary effect that he then ran 996. So yeah, you, you, you just never know your ceiling. But the issue is circumstance, right? If your floor isn't high enough to show, show coaches and national governing bodies the, the potential of where your ceiling could be, right? You're not going to get support if you don't get support, you're not going to reach your ceiling, right? So it's a rock in a hard place. So the issue is, I think probably most people never understand or even reach their ceiling. But at the end of the day, 
it's probably because their floor wasn't high enough to show the powers that be what they were capable of. Do, do you feel like there's, I know you point out something that's very, very true. Do you, do you feel, do you think there's any way around that? Is there a better way to scout for talent? Is there a better way to develop athletes long-term uh, mm. for, let's say for, for, for a nation state? Um, would there be a better model than the one that's currently in place if there ever was one? That's a huge question. I'm not sure. Um, it's hard to see an answer. It's hard to see an answer. You know, some people go down the, I know even football clubs now are doing the, the genetic testing. Um, but even from what I've seen of, of that, because, you know, I got along with some of my teammates, like I mentioned before, genetic tests back in 2015. And I got another one um, last year. It's amazing how much that knowledge and the literature around it has changed in five years. Mm. Such a young science, right? Such a young science. So people would say, oh, well, you can use that because you can see how, how good someone's going to be. It's, it's not the case. So I don't think there's, an, right now, there doesn't seem, there's not an answer. There's not an answer. I suppose you could, one way you could possibly look at it is look at, if we're looking at speed and power events specifically, if in other tests and measures, an athlete is able to achieve huge power outputs, but perhaps in their specific event, they're not as good as um, X, Y, and Z other athletes. You might look at where's the flaw here. Is there a glaring technical flaw or a glaring physical flaw that could be fixed either long-term or, or even short-term for some flaws? Because mm -hmm. I think if, if, British athletics had tested all of their sprinters at 23. Um, Joel, my teammate, if they're looking at peak power, would have been as good or better than any of them, most probably. He'd have certainly be up, been up there, right? But wouldn't have been running as quick as them. So they could look at that and being like, okay, there's potential here. Obviously, in, in a gross test of power, there's potential. Because I think my thought process back then was that if anything was innate, it was top speed, that a hell of a lot of people are power enough, powerful enough to accelerate. But to have the reactivity, the stiffness, um, the rhythm, coordination um, to hit a 260 flying 30, right? That is just, that's innate. You've either got it or you haven't. What Joel did changed my view on that because Joel was never blessed with a ridiculous top speed, but then was able to run 996 and run 260s for flying 30. Mm. So that really did change my mind on it. The fact, and so, you know, if he'd have been tested for pure power, a uh, load of pure power metrics in his early stages of sprinting, you know, someone might have looked at that and saying, look, he's, he's definitely an outlier here doesn't match up with his 100 meter time you know we should probably look at investing in this guy so maybe you'd be looking at something like that that the there would be other factors other than just the event performance that national governing bodies and um, talent academies would look at so it might be this guy's lagging behind on his um, long jump distance but actually if you look at all of his other metrics in testing they're really, really good. So we should probably take a chance with this athlete rather than dropping him off the talent pathway. So, you know, just thinking off the bat, that would might be a good way of looking at it. Yeah. And, and, and again, we get into the, the trouble of taking chances, <laughs> which is probably not the, the inclination of, uh, of the people putting money behind athletes. Exactly. That's it. And, it's always a gamble, right? Hmm. For these guys. And you, you can't blame them for dropping people off that aren't performing. It's as simple as that. And at the end of the day, it's sport. It's mm -hmm. a tough world. Mm -hmm. It's a tough world. Um, but yeah, you get, you get late bloomers. I think, yeah, you get late bloomers all over the place. And uh, yeah, I think you've got to be pretty mentally strong to get through that. Because a lot of the time, if you don't share that talent at a young age, you're just going to become disenfranchised and 
unsupported so your likelihood of actually reaching your ceiling is gone i wanted to go back to the your specifics of, of programming and coaching um and that was also a question that came up on instagram when i talked uh, about having you on can you talk about volume and load management around jumping for non-jumping specific athletes so say a rugby player let's keep with with that because i have a bit of a, a crowd um, listening around around this sport so how do you manage jumps for um rugby players and maybe more specifically for the for the heavier guys uh because we yeah. want them to be explosive we want them moving fast but we have to manage the fact that they carry some body weight around which is necessary for this sport um so how do you adjust for that Yeah, so I mean, first and foremost, much lower volume. First and foremost, much lower volume. And, you know, I've seen this manifest in track and field guys moving to bobsleigh and putting on loads of weight. Suddenly their ability to handle impact volume diminishes quite significantly. Mm -hmm. So much lower volume and handling uh, landing forces. So I'd be looking at more jumps up. So with a lot of guys, anybody that's under my programming will, will know my, my stair jump series. So I do a lot of jumps up steps because um, obviously you're reducing your, uh, your landing forces significantly. Um, for the heavier guys, bilateral over unilateral. If you are going to go unilateral, for me, it's going to be pretty much always be in um, a skipping motion because that, that's very natural and it doesn't overload Um, the jumping leg too much because you've got a more optimal penultimate stride and um, it takes very little coaching because everyone skips in the playground since they were a child right so you don't need to do a load of coaching on them getting the perfect contact yeah if you get those guys to bound pretty much every one of them will be landing on his toes just get shin splints on day one so you make make them skip everyone does like a nice flat footed contact perfect player takeoff Just make those guys skip. So skip first, because everyone can do it naturally. But yeah, low, it's, it's pretty simple, much lower volume. And just really mitigate your landing forces. So upstairs or soft surfaces, and the vast majority of it being, being bilateral. Mm. Yeah. And I think just looking at, looking at how much um, impact load they've got, and that covers running in their program in general. And then looking, um, deciding whether you need plyometrics in the traditional sense, you know, in the program, mm -hmm. because sometimes you don't. Um, people think they're the holy grail, but they're also a more stressful and probably more um, risky modality to put in there, especially for heavy guys. Mm -hmm. um, I use a lot of throws, a lot of explosive throws, as you've probably seen. Um, Again, it's a track and field staple, but yeah, it's, it's slow SSC, but it's still SSC, right? So you're still developing elastic qualities of the organism. Mm. Um, but that's much easier to handle for the heavier guys. It's got more of a bias on the hip and knee as well. And what I find with heavier guys jumping is it's usually the lower limb that's going to pack up first. So that's usually a pretty good thing to put in there. So. Uh, yeah, medicine ball tosses and med, med ball um, jumps with throws, that sort of thing. Just slowing the contact down a little bit, um, being a little bit more concentric in nature. Mm. I think really overloading the eccentric or um, eccentric, eccentric rate of force development is just pretty risky for those heavier guys. And even just for games players in general, people forget how much volume they're getting of, um, of contacts, sprinting, and just medium intensity, just running, just miles. There's a lot of miles on those legs. There's a lot of miles on the Achilles tendon. There's a lot of miles going through the shins. Um, the amount of shin splints I see when people start plyometrics. I mean, for one, because people will start trying to do plyos like they're a triple jumper when they're not. <laughs> so they've already got, they might have done 3K that day on the pitch anyway. And then they go and start trying to do, you know, hop, hop steps, hop, hop steps. Like they've seen on, on Instagram or they've seen some track and field athlete doing. And then they're in rugby boots and they're landing on their toe. And then, yeah, suddenly they've, you know, filled the glass too much. It's overflowing and they've got shin splints and you've got a, you've got a calm nose down. So, yeah, there's going to be no jumping for them for a while. 
so yeah to, to get to that point because yeah certainly for some of the speedsters some high level plyometrics will they'll be able to do them and it would probably get some great performance benefits but you've got to get up to that point um, logically and so definitely some um you've got to prog progress that really quite gradually with those guys when people have already got high loading because you're just adding another high impact high intensity component to a program when they've already got a lot of volume you know so yeah i think the biggest question is is if and why you're going to be using the biometrics and then if you are just err on the side of caution ben i want to finish with a couple of questions from uh, coming from the instagram the first one was uh, do you recommend track shoes uh, for beginners who who would be sprinting mm. i do like spikes for beginners but i don't go with a sprint spike um you know obviously if they're if they're training on a on a, on a running track uh, i don't see any issue with people training on their playing surface um, the one advantage you get with a running track is you, you can hit higher velocities. So perhaps there's a conditioning element to obviously you hitting a higher velocity on the track. Maybe your speed envelope is going to open up a little bit, or maybe you're just conditioning yourself against hamstring strains at top speeds. And that's going to happen in game situations. For my rugby guys, they wear, they do wear spikes from the training on the athletics track. Mm -hmm. um, but I always recommend a middle distance or a jump spike um, with a slight heel. I myself rarely actually train in sprint spikes now. It's almost always middle distance or jump because they have that slight heel and they're a little bit softer. So the thing is you're going to get with a sprint spike is not only have you got a really aggressive plate that's going to transfer force really quickly um, through all of your um, lower limb structures, there's actually a buildup from the spike plate to the heel. So you've got a negative drop. So there's going to be, if you don't have uh, sufficient stiffness in the lower limb structures in the Achilles, you're going to just get more stretch in the Achilles itself. Um, that's going to be an abnormal load compared to what you're used to in rugby boots, um, coming at you on a hard surface and at a high velocity. So it's a recipe for disaster and you're going to get Achilles issues. So for all the rugby guys listening, if you're going to sprint on the track, I would definitely recommend middle distance spikes first. Um, you'll thank me for it because you get all the grip that you get with another pair of athletic spikes um, without the overlay, overload you're going to get through the Achilles tendon. So that's my answer on that one. Get middle distance spikes. When you, Don't be scared to run on the track. And when you go from running maybe only on the, on the pitch or sometimes on the track, but just with, with runners on, how much of a transition do you want to give yourself when you start using spikes? Yeah, I'll usually, um, I'll probably always do if three to four weeks in trainers, to be honest, depending on how hard the surface they, they've been on is, you know, if people are playing summer rugby and they've been in boots on a baked rugby pitch, that's a pretty tough surface actually. And so they may, they may be good to go straight into spikes, but you know, as a rule of thumb, if people are transitioning from grass onto a track, I'm always, always going to, always going to do a couple of weeks in trainers first, and then they're going to go from trainers to their middle distance spikes. Yeah. And then you, you know, I've got, I've got dual sports, sport guys that have done track and field as well. And, you know, they, they already have sprint spikes and they've already done a lot of track and it's like, yeah, they, I'll, I'll let them sprint in the sprint spikes, but you know, I'm more confident they're not going to get any issues from that. But, but even so I'll keep them in trainers when they're transitioning. Um, yeah, as, as with anything, it's always progressive. It's always progressive. I really don't like spikes in load, in volume. Um, and I'm very careful around change because that's in the past from my own perspective where things have gone wrong. Yeah. Last question, Ben, what would be your advice for young athletes who maybe dreamed to one day make it to the top? Um, number one, don't stress. You've got a lot of time. The competition in two weeks time um, is not the end of the world. You never know what your ceiling is, like we've talked about. And to find a good coach, 
that's probably the biggest one really is find a good coach yeah i'd say they're the, they're the two they're the two main things and also don't specialize too early yeah ben where can people find out more about uh what you do uh so you can follow me on instagram at, at ben the bounce um you can follow my program in business at semtex underscore systems and then there's also my website which is semtexsystems.co.uk um, where you can sign up for for coaching and there will soon be um, some blogs going on there as well so stay tuned awesome man I'll, I'll link all of those in the show description and i uh, just really want to thank you for taking the time and coming on it was a pleasure talking with you no it's great to chat to you thanks for all the questions guys it's just been a good one thanks ben talk soon no problem